On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumnus, Dr. Uri Meyer, to address convocation. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor, distinguished members of the platform party, honored guests, graduates, and their families, members of the faculty and staff, friends. I am deeply moved by the great honor you have chosen to confer on me. I would like to thank Dean Wood, Professor Stokes of the Don Wright Faculty of Music, Carol Stinson, and all the others who were active in support of this honorary degree. I consider myself extremely fortunate to be standing here today. I have a long-standing connection of 30 years to this city, its community, its orchestra, as well as the University of Western Ontario. I have many friends who taught or are teaching, former and current students at the faculties of the Dentistry, School of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, Law, Medicine, and Music. I consider them part of my extended family. Over the years, I was the beneficiary of the most gracious hospitality in many homes here in London. When I was first invited to conduct the London Symphony, now known as Orchestra London, I was struck by the positive attitude of the musicians, some of them leading teachers at the Faculty of Music. They were keen, totally engaged, and had faith in this very young conductor. I was asked to accompany one of the most celebrated pianists of our time, the Chilean artist Claudio Arau, in no less than Brahms's Piano Concerto No. 1, a work of enormous proportions. This was akin to being placed in the captain's seat of a 747 jumbo jet, a young pilot whose previous experience was equivalent to flying a Cessna. <laughs> Some years later, I had the pleasure to present several new works by professors Behrens, Wunsch, and later Mozart's opera Titus in a concert version brilliantly adapted by Professor Emeritus McKellar. Many others, faculty and graduates from performing with me as soloists either in London or in other cities. As I reflect on the long road which led me here, I realize that I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the many teachers and mentors who guided and helped me along the way and to the many lucky breaks I received. I'll name them all. This road was often difficult and complicated, but it was always exciting and full of surprises. You, the new graduates, may not realize it now, but from this day forth, the direction of your lives may profoundly change. You're about to embark on a great adventure. I know that my life has taken many unexpected turns. and It has been a fascinating voyage. Let me share with you briefly how I got here. It all started in northwestern Romania, in a province known as Transylvania, where my parents returned having survived World War II and the Holocaust. We lived in a small town with three distinct ethnic groups, Romanian, Hungarian, and German and a small Jewish community. From a very early age, we were taught several languages, and my parents instilled in me the importance of respecting the diversity and richness of the different cultures. They also emphasized the importance of art and music as an integral part of our lives. Our town had a very good conservatory of music, a municipal theater, a symphony orchestra, and an art gallery. There was also a university and a medical school. I have many fond memories of my childhood there in Romania, but I'd like to tell you about one which especially stands out. One summer evening when I was about seven years old, I was strolling in the beautiful Carpathian woods with my caretaker, a woman in her 50s. There was a full moon which we admired. She asked me to take a very good look at the moon and spoke to me of her son, a rocket scientist working in Germany. Remember this sight, my boy, someday. Someday in your lifetime, 
people will be walking on that moon. You know the rest of the story. Neil Armstrong landed there less than 15 years later. That probably set the stage for my desire to take risks and set high goals for the future. I often thought of that walk in the forest and the encouragement I received to dream and even to aspire to achieve those dreams. When I was in my early teens, we moved to Israel, a dramatic and traumatic change. I was accepted by the Conservatory of Music in Tel Aviv into the class of Professor Partosh, a virtuoso instrumentalist and a renowned composer. He was my direct link to the great Austro-Hungarian traditions of music. I spent 10 years under his powerful guidance. During that time, I also began my orchestral and conducting training in the Israeli Youth Orchestra with a great pedagogue and conductor, Shalom Bronli Riklis. Riklis was a taskmaster par excellence who demanded and received highly polished performances from this ensemble. It was the dedication and methodical instruction of Riklis which shaped the remarkable achievements of members of that excellent group. Some of them became doctors, scientists, teachers, conductors, soloists, or members of fine orchestras. This accomplished conductor and teacher was among those who enriched and played a critical role in my life. Indeed, I have incorporated his methodology in my teaching today. I arrived at the Juilliard School for postgraduate education in my early 20s, eager to improve my skills and hopefully to polish my art. Soon after arriving in New York, I paid a visit to Leonard Bernstein, who had recommended me to the school. After telling him that I had settled in and wished to observe his rehearsals and concerts with the New York Philharmonic, he invited me to attend any event of my choice and asked a couple of simple but most important questions. Do you have enough to eat? Can I help you in any way? This world-renowned and very busy genius somehow always found time to encourage, mentor, and support young talent. Thanks to him, many other young musicians and I got the breaks needed to start our careers. I learned yet again the importance of nurturing gifted people. Some people called him a real mensch, which translated means an honest-to-goodness fine human being. After I graduated from Juilliard School, I came to Canada to join the Montreal Symphony, intending to stay for perhaps one or two years. I decided to expand my horizons and enrolled at the Sir George Williams University, now Concordia, to read philosophy, law, French, and English. Still not perfect. Shortly after arriving in Montreal, I was asked to lead a new orchestra of young, recent graduates in need of employment. The older people here may recall the LIP, or Local Initiatives Program, of the federal government. Its purpose was to train young professionals of different vocations in need of experience. And it was successful. Governments occasionally do good things for people. That was the beginning of my odyssey as a young conductor teacher, and that was almost 40 years ago. Since then, I lived in three beautiful provinces, in, cities, in the cities of Montreal, Edmonton, and Toronto, brought classical music to audiences from St. John's to Victoria and Inuvik, and collaborated with and learned, learned from many of Canada's world-class artists. I could not have realized my aspirations without the lasting influence and musicianship of two exceptional music directors of the Montreal Symphony, Franz Paul Becker and Charles Dutrois, who, by the way, conducted concert here, a concert here. They, eleva they elevated a respected but a not very well-known ensemble to the status of one of the world's top orchestras. How fortunate I was to be in a position to observe their leadership over a 10-year period and to play in the orchestra under their guidance. A long list of guest conductors led the MSO, and experiencing their musical insights was at least as important as the former education I'd previously acquired. Along the way, 
I gained tremendously from my colleagues' advice and constructive feedback. Being a conductor is like being a manager of a large corporation, except for the fact that most music schools did not prepare my generation for the complicated business side of the enterprise. That was a challenge I had to learn for myself. However, let me clarify. No conductor or manager can succeed without the talents and collaboration, the artistry and the commitment of one's fellow musicians or team. It is the musicians who actually produce the sound, and it is the conductor's function to present music with creativity and enthusiasm. I often wondered how one can, with a stroke of an arm, communicate to 100 people or more exactly when they have to play, how to shape a phrase, balance a chord, or sing a beautiful line. How one can, with a smile or a kind facial expression, sweeten the sound of a choir. I believe that like conductors, you as professionals will find the time and have the patience to listen to colleagues and coworkers, tap into their knowledge and experience, look beyond the obvious, encourage creativity and be receptive to new and interesting ideas. Now, you may assume that the life of a traveling conductor must be always organized and accompanied by several devoted assistants. Such was not the case when I conducted the Calgary Philharmonic during a visit to the Banff Center. I was housed in the residence a distance of less than 100 meters from the concert hall. I was all dressed up in my white tie, long black tails, ready to arrive at the concert 10 minutes before curtain time. As I left the building, I was startled to find a huge Alberta moose standing in my path. Frankly, I was rather frightened. I contemplated my options and stood. A few minutes later, when it was almost time for the performance to begin and no one came to the rescue, I decided to walk, wondering about the probable headlines in the morning newspapers. Conducted eyes, attacked by a moose, dressed to kill in formal attire. <laughs> Only in Canada. But more seriously, it is a great privilege to be engaged in one, one's life passion. I have found that to perform and to teach in a medium that crosses all boundaries of language, culture and economic status, provides great satisfaction. That is because the grammar of music is a grammar that is part of our human unconscious. We instinctively and intuitively understand the language of music. Bach and many other composers managed to identify and express what is beautiful and what is meaningful in our very chaotic world. These experiences of music tie us together and human, on a human level and deepen our sense of community. The German poet Schiller wrote, Freude, schöner Götterfunken, Tochteras, Elysium, alle Menschen werden Brüder, wo dein sanfter Hügel weilt, which translates to, joy, bright spark of divinity, daughter of Elysium, and most important, all men become brothers under the sway of thy gentle wings. Schiller's text was incorporated by Beethoven in his greatest and probably best known composition, the last movement of his Ninth Symphony, also known as the Ode to Joint Symphony. I was asked to conduct the symphony numerous times while I was working in Japan. I was surprised to learn that since the 1950s, the Ninth is played annually hundreds of times in all the major cities of that country. Does it take a tragedy of a catastrophic world war to remind people of all nations that Schiller's lyrics were sensible? Is it possible that the recent visit to North Korea by the New York Philharmonic has increased the chances for a peaceful resolution of the differences on the Korean Peninsula? Would a possible visit 
by an American orchestra to Cuba, break the ice, and usher in a new spring in future relations with the United States. Fortunately, all societies benefit from time to time when business leaders, sportsmen, or artists extend their talents and influence beyond their specific fields or professions. A wonderful example of an entire country enjoying the fruits of imaginative leadership is the Venezuelan economist Jose Antonio Abreu, who founded and organized a network of youth orchestras in 1975. It is also known as El Sistema and is a way of encouraging children who live in poverty to take up music rather than crime. They are nurtured and taught by dedicated teachers, given a free general education and musical education. Because of the courage and the foresight of Abreu, the financial support of the government and of private business in that country, over one million lives of poor children in Venezuela were radically improved. Many graduates have earned positions in first-class orchestras around the world, and their star graduate, Gustavo Dudamel, is at age 27, the brilliant conductor and music director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. You might have watched him last night on PBS conducting that orchestra in Mahler's first symphony. Imagine the educational and social benefits of a similar program if you were to implement one in Canada. And now I have come full circle. I am receiving immense joy in sharing my experiences, knowledge, and lessons learned with the students at the Royal Conservatory of Music, the Glen Gould School in Toronto. I am extremely grateful to be living in this country, a country that welcomes people from around the globe, treating them with equality and respect, a country where you can actually realize your dreams. Today, is the celebration of your convocation after long years of study. I am very touched to be included in this beautiful ceremony celebrating the culmination of your success. I hope that many of you will remain here in Canada and contribute to the well-being of our society and improvement of the quality of life that is still the envy of much of the world. I hope that many of you, regardless of your profession, will pay heed to the importance of the arts, that you will listen to music of any genre, see live theater, visit a museum or art gallery, enjoy an opera, ballet, or a dance performance. Whatever your preference, I hope that you will become a supporter of the arts in all its forms. I wish you all every success in your future careers and satisfaction in whatever you do. And most of all, much health and happiness in your private lives. Congratulations. <laughs>